Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us um, for this cross-disciplinary discussion of healthcare delivery in low and middle income uh, countries. My name is Paul Clyde. I'm the president of the William Davidson Institute at the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, Michigan is a place that has an unusual group of schools of very high quality, all speaking to healthcare. And today we're going to take advantage of that. And I'd like to begin by introducing the panelists we have, uh, we have Vicki Ellengrad, who is a John Gideon Cyril Professor of Pharmacy and Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy. Uh, we have Joe Collards, who is a Senior Associate Dean for Education and Global Initiatives, and the Josiah Macy Jr. Professor for Health Professions, Professions Education at the University of Michigan Medical School. We have Jody Laurie, who is a professor and associate dean for global affairs at the University of Michigan School of Nursing, and Abram Wagner, who is a research assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. So thank you all for joining us and welcome. Um, I wanna give a little bit of background to put this in context. Up until COVID, uh, if we looked at global health, we had seen enormous improvements over the past uh, few decades. Um, some vaccine-related deaths had dropped by as much as 90%. Um, most of the major causes of death had dropped significantly over the past couple decades. Um, COVID obviously is going to push us back significantly in that regard, but we know enough about what's going on that um, the causes of death are going to be more varied and more similar to what we see in high-income countries and that it's not just going to be malaria, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, uh, vaccine related deaths. Um, we're gonna see more um, chronic diseases, for instance. And the result is um, a cross-disciplinary discipline, cross perspective on this will become even more valuable. Um, at the same time, we've seen the business opportunities increase dramatically um, because, uh, in the, the expenditures on healthcare in, in low and middle income countries have gone up three times as fast as they've gone up in high income countries. Um, so this is a great opportunity to, to bring together this group that we have. And I should add that this is sort of the, the jumping off point for a course that is being offered for the first time this year um, that will also be taught by these four. And uh, the course is open to across campus. Um, in fact, if, though, if there are students online who are interested, um, we are at capacity for the School of Nursing, the School of Public Health, and I think we have one more spot for someone from Ross. But we do have a few positions, a uh, few openings available for students from the medical school, um, the College of Pharmacy, and if there are other schools on campus, we really want to have teams that are, are cross-disciplinary within the classroom as well. So you can keep that in mind. That will begin um, in the, the second half of October. Um, so with that as background, um, I'd like to start by asking a, a first general question. Jody, I'll start with you. Um, if you were talking to a colleague who had never worked in a low and middle income country, or you can pick the one of your choice, what would you tell them was the single most important thing to know about how it differed from what was done in Ann Arbor within your profession? Thanks, Paul. So, um, so picking one thing is really difficult, but I will, uh, I'll try. So I'm a nurse midwife by background, and I think one of the things that I wasn't prepared for the first time I went and worked in a low and middle income country was seeing the seeing women in my situation um, die from a simple injury or a condition that a person would not die from if they were in a place like Ann Arbor, where we have so many resources and so many, um, so many ways that we can, we can treat different, different things that come in through the door. So I had been a midwife probably for 10 years before I traveled globally and did this kind of work. And I was probably at hundreds, if not thousands of births and I had never seen a woman die in labor. And when I went to Africa for the first time, I was probably there less than a week and someone died who came into the hospital where we were, where we were doing trainings. We were doing clinical trainings to upgrade skills. And I would say, you can read about it. And I knew that maternal mortality was high, but I wasn't 
I wasn't emotionally ready for it to see it in that light. Did, can, you, can you comment briefly on how that impacted the rest of your trip there and then work subsequently? So it, it, so it impacted my work Im immensely uh, because I was there doing clinical training and I, and so I, we had that first death, but we had other deaths while I was there. And it made, it really made me ask so many questions. And it's actually what got me started in doing research in low and middle income countries was trying to figure out why were these women dying? They looked just like women who, you know, came through the door in places that I had worked in the United States. And so why were these particular women dying? So that's, that's sort of what got me started on my, on the research that I do today. Thank you. Abram. Yeah, I'm gonna put a bit more of a positive spin on my answer. Um, I've had the fortune of working with great collaborators in a number of different countries and more recently, mostly in China and Indonesia. And one thing I will say is that they have this, this, this hunger and they, um, of learning what works best in other countries and figuring out how to apply it into their own country. Uh, just a quick anecdote, recently I was helping one of my uh, colleagues who works in the immunization division of a health department. And she was working on comparing sort of vaccine introductions in China and how that works compared to other different countries. And I think the idea of what she was trying to do is figure out what's the best way of introducing this new um, polio vaccine into uh, Shanghai. And I've you know worked not as much, but similarly with some people in health departments here in the United States, uh, and I can actually tell kind of the opposite stories where I've tried to work with them on incorporating sort of comparisons with, with what's happening abroad and what are best practices. And I think they themselves are very receptive, but I think on a policy level in the United States, there's this reticence for incorporating data from other countries. Like we kind of want to isolate ourselves and think, you know, we're the best ones. But I think in a lot of areas, we can be learning from other countries. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Vicki? Um, so uh, thanks for the question. I think I'm going to be somewhere in between Abram and Jody in my response. Um, in that my, first of all, I just want to say my, my experience in working in um, low middle income countries is fairly limited in that I pretty much go to one geographical location um, in Kenya. Um, but what has, I think, been the, uh, the thing that I think people need to understand, it, and, and it probably one of the most frustrating things for me going there, is that the citizens of Kenya, where we go, are absolutely wonderful people that want nothing more than to see improvements in human health, but getting that process going and doing the research to do that locally, and, because you can't always take what we do in the United States and just plop it down in the middle of this country. It's not necessarily going to work. You have to do your own research. Getting that research going is often not as simple a process as it is here in the United States. Research is who we are. It's what we do. It's, it's our, our um, values of, of scientific evidence to move our decisions forward is, I think, what, what makes us great. But um, a lot of the, um, I guess, the administrative decisions about how to get research done um, tend to be very layered. Um, and there's not always that um, embracing of the scientific method uh, to improve human health. Joe, can you add to that? Yeah, boy, um, I like what my colleagues have said. and. I hear bits of what I want to say in all of them, but I guess my first piece of advice to somebody going there for the first time would be to say, leave your assumptions at the door. Um, I think most of the time we all navigate based on our assumptions and what we believe our own lived truths are. So I see so many people go into low income countries and the first thing they're hit with is, wow, this is different than my practice or my context. We don't have what we have here at Michigan Medicine. And there are certain things that we hold as bedrock truth where we've come from. And they, they say, well, of course we do this. And it's just, um, it's really at the end of the day, some of them are assumptions. 
So my advice would be to say, let go of your assumptions. Instead of doing all the comparisons to where you're coming from and what we have where we are right now, try and look to see if it's appropriate to the situation. Um, is it contributing to the end in mind? rather than this temptation we all fall into. If only they had the things we had um, back where we're coming from, things would be better. So we're helping them to recreate our reality um, and, and what we're missing as opposed to what's appropriate for the situation. So that would be my best piece of advice, Paul. So, so let me follow up on that a little bit. Is there, um, what I hear you saying is in some cases, what they're doing is different from what one might have expected coming from Ann Arbor, but in some sense better. Um, that there, there is something to be learned from, from that process. Um, is that, am I hearing you correctly? And if so, is there, um, are there uh, examples of that that you can think of? I mean, Abram already spoke to this a little bit, I think. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of our practices can at times turn into ritual well, this is what we do for patients like this or in situations like this. And we're not as critical of ourselves in terms of, is this valuable and most appropriate to the situation? Um, you know, as you'll, you've heard or you'll hear in this course, you know, we've got the most expensive health system in the world by far. But if you, wear, if you measure our quality parameters, um, we're 37th in the world. So we're really expensive. We do things because we do things, but do they really um, add value? Um, and I think um, our assumptions sometimes can lock us in. There's one example, Paul, that comes to mind recently. I run a joint institute in China and I'm there four or five times a year. And people would always marvel at when people have colds and infections there, everyone wears masks. You know, there's this Asian phenomena of everyone reacts if you've got a little sniffle, wear a mask. And we would tend to poo-poo that idea in the U.S. and say, you know, masks, not that helpful. We don't do that. Um, and, um, and it's something that would be very Asian, but not American. Now the things we've learned from COVID-19 is to say, no, masks aren't perfect. They only reduce it. 50 or 70 percent but when you're in a pandemic that's huge right now we're all wearing masks and uh and you know uh asia had probably a better approach all along but that's one of those examples we bring our assumptions yeah they're not up on the science like we are no we're now informed by the more appropriate science so we have to keep an open mind rather than us bringing what we're sure are our truths to other settings. Um, what issues in healthcare provision? I, sh I should add that some of these questions have come from some of the students enrolled in the class. Um, and so I want to get them out there as sort of a kickoff to the class. What issues in healthcare provision have tended to show up across most low and middle income countries? Joe, you want to start with that one? Um, one of them is um, a really common thing that people crave is um, is human resource development. So you'll hear this term a lot, human resources for health. How do we train health providers um, so that we can enhance the, the access that people have to health? So many places don't have the, the kinds of nurses, the pharmacists, the doctors, the public health people that they want or need. And this is a, is a huge requirement. What are the training systems that are there to produce the workforce? And then what are the economic systems there that uh, allow people to, to be hired? Uh, Africa, where I spent a lot of time, the, the burden of disease there is 25% of the world. So 25% of the disease burden is in Africa. They have fewer than 2% of the healthcare workers. So um, we can come up with new vaccines and fancy things, but if there isn't somebody to push the plunger and to actually be the person who's providing the care um, or the research as Vicki had pushed out. I think that's a really common issue in low-income countries. Vicki, I'm guessing that's true for pharmacists as well. Um, you have anyth anything to add to that issues you see and, and how it varies from country to country? I think, yes. And so if you go into any chemist, 
um, in, in, um, in most places in Africa, um, you will see a computer. But that computer is very different than the computer you will see in Kroger or CVS or Walgreens or wherever it is that you go, um, in that that computer is really used to calculate the price of the medication. There's no patient profiles, there's no drug interaction, um, there's, there's very little of the cognitive services that most of um, you know, the citizens of the United States have come to expect, um, even though they, they don't know that, that what, that's, what they're, that's what they are. Um, and moving um, the practice of pharmacy from where they are now in low and middle income countries to where to what we have in the United States is very challenging because they don't have the healthcare providers that have experience in those. And so we've we've tried to work with some of the local pharmacists to provide them um, with some of the training and some resources, bringing over references, uh, that sort of thing, talking to them about what this could to do to their practice of pharmacy. But unfortunately, it often um, boils down to the cost associated with it. And um, because uh, so much of healthcare is a fee for service, that um, if people don't understand the value in, in what they're paying for, they're, they're just not going to pay for it. Um, so I, I, I agree very much um, with, with what Joe is talking about. There needs to be a critical uh, investment in um, the training of the healthcare providers, but making sure that they have the people to train the healthcare providers as well. So th let me follow up a little bit on your point about the information technology. It's, um, it, it, I, there's a lot of work going on in that right now. Do you see an opportunity there for leapfrogging much the way telecom did and uh, moving to cell phones in Africa? Um, they didn't have landlines, they just moved straight ahead, said straight ahead to cell phones in that you might see, I mean, there are barriers to in the United States, for instance, to uh, information transfers with, with health, health information that might not be there in Africa. So in some sense, um, they, there might be uh, advantages they could take, they, they could capitalize on. So I think that it's it's not necessarily that they don't have the technology. It's it's having a workforce that understands how to use the technology as well. And so you could, I mean, we could very easily, you know, create a, a fairly simple computer system that would allow patient profiles and drug interaction checking. But if you don't have a workforce that yeah. really knows how to utilize that, that that creates part of the problem. And if you don't have a consumer base that values that and wants that information um, as well. I think that that's the other part of it. Right, okay, thank you. Abram, you already talked a little bit about some of the advantages. Can you comment um, on issues in terms of healthcare provision? Yeah, I mean, I would say one of the big movements in public health in the past uh, you know, half century or so has been this idea of um, healthcare as a right. And I think that's closely tied with uh, promotion of primary health care. Uh, and I would say in, you know, the two countries that I work with the most, they've had differing histories about this. And certainly as a contrast in the United States, this is, you know, something that we don't talk about and we have a very private insurance heavy system. Um, but fortunately, I think a lot of low and middle income countries are taking a different approach. So for instance, China, when it private, started privatizing its economy in the late 70s and 80s, they uh, really got rid of a lot of infrastructure for primary health care, but um, they've built a lot of it back up in the past couple decades. And I would say that at least in urban areas, there's a pretty robust infrastructure of uh, these public uh, community health centers, which are great sort of um, first stops for visiting like a, a primary health care physician or a nurse for vaccination and things like that. So they make it very convenient. And I think um, Indonesia in the past decade or so has sort of followed a similar route in developing um, this huge network of community health centers, which they call Puskasmas. And I think, uh, you know, it, it's just in contrast to the United States. So I think in a way, this riffing off of what other people are saying, I think, um, thinking about where people are investing is really important. Certainly having secondary and tertiary healthcare centers is really, is, is important, but from a public health perspective and from like an impact, these primary healthcare centers are, um, you know, the most important thing.
Yeah. And you, I see them in a lot of the countries I work in as well. Um, Jody, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I would just really echo what, what Joe and Vicki said and, and add that, um, you know, nurses and midwives are the largest segment of the healthcare population or the healthcare providers in most of these countries. And all of those primary healthcare facilities are staffed by nurses and midwives. Uh, and usually they're the only provider for, you know, populations of 20 to 30 to 50,000 people. And so the human resources for health, while the training and the education and having the adequate faculty is really important, the other issue is, is keeping, getting nurses and midwives and healthcare providers out to some of these rural areas to provide care and the barriers that they face when they're out there because they have so they're remote, they're rural, they have very little support, they're sort of on their own, out there on their own. Often they're not from those communities, so the communities don't always uh, embrace an outsider coming in to provide health care. So I think that those are some of the some of the other issues that tend to show up. And so they feel like sometimes they're out there and people forget about them as a health care provider. Yeah. Especially in rural markets, I, we've, we've seen that be a challenge in a number of the organizations we work with as well. Um, Vicki, let me start with you on uh, what cultural contextual issue did you struggle with the most in getting involved in the work? Um, I think in, in terms of um, cultural issues, it's, it would, would go around my comments of the value of, of research and the importance of properly identifying issues um, to the, for them that you can then build on um, to make improvements to the healthcare setting. Um, I think in terms of contextual issues, um, I really struggle um, with kind of the practice of pharmacy. And so I'll, I'll give you a, a, an example. I think, I think a, a nice thing, and, and I agree with all the, uh, the community health care centers, I think that's a great practice. And I wish that we had more of that kind of in the United States. Um, but, you know, the other part of that is um, pharmacies tend to be um, the over-the-counter um, laws are a little bit different and that there's much broader access which can be good and bad so the first time i was there i was standing working with a local chemist and um behind the counter and a woman came in who had a prescription for a non-sedating antihistamine and an antibiotic and a cough suppressant um, and then she added on um you know two more antibiotics to that and i was just kind of shocked that the chemist didn't say anything to her because it was very much therapeutic duplication. And um, after I talked with her a little bit, she really just had allergies. She didn't need any of the antibiotics. Um, and I realized though that it was in, in him saying no, that this is a therapeutic duplication, he was giving up money um, for his business. And so it was kind of this, this balance and, um, you know, so, that that was that was a little bit hard for me to um, get over, um, and again, partly why I've been trying to look more at um, people understanding how they're using or why they're using their medications. Um, but again, challenges with people um, understanding the importance of that work. So we we observed something similar to that in Uganda with um, uh, diarrheal disease that where antibiotics were being prescribed instead of ORS, which was the recommended, even the medical professionals were not um, recommending the ORS. And I think some of it had to do with this, with you know the fact that the, the kiosk had antibiotics, so they wanted to sell the antibiotics. Do you have thoughts on, on how you deal with something like that? So unfortunately, my internet is a little bit unstable. I didn't hear, I, but my guess is it has to do with kind of vending machine antibiotics and kind of being available. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, in, in some ways, you know, having, um, it, it, we certainly have a problem with antibiotics being overprescribed. And, and I've not looked at the literature. I don't know if there's a huge amount of literature in, in regards to antibiotic resistance in um, low and middle income countries. I'm sure there is. I've just not, I've just not looked at it. 
Um, so it, it is having a balance between having access to the to the need and then also make sure you don't have um, the you know the antibiotic um, resistance. I think um, I think you know that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, Joe, can you uh, talk about the cultural contextual issue that you struggle with the most when you got involved in this work? Um, probably the one I struggled with the most is the tendency for paternalistic attitudes amongst um, healthcare providers and the cultures in which they operate. I think that was, I know that was true in the United States here, where uh, a little bit more, I'm a healthcare professional, do what you're told. Um, a little bit less checking in with people to understand what's going on. And I think with our enlightened ways here in the United States, we try and approach it as more of a, an informed partnership. But the thing that just struck me was that healthcare workers amongst the poor could be just viewed as gods and they would just tell people and sometimes be callous and more, um, uh, more thoughtless than I thought they could or should be. That was the biggest thing. Probably a specific example of that, um, was in 96, I, I moved to uh, China to develop their first uh, Western healthcare system and had the first license they had ever given a Chinese person. And just the, the concept of how you deal and talk about death was just so discordant from what I was used to. For one thing, I used to work on the liver transplant center here and suddenly I was immersed in a program where um, they had a liver transplant program, but as soon as they had a, a candidate, they would take a prisoner, they would shoot the prisoner in the operating room and charge the family for the bullet. And, you know, I was supposed to be a part of that. And how, how, how do I separate myself? And this was, and eventually the families would find out what happened, but this was a very real part of the culture. How do you manage that? To this day, um, and this is something I still have the hardest time getting around is if you tell somebody in China they've got a cancer or their, their time might be coming to the end, that's not something that's part of the culture. That's so important for me as a gastroenterologist here because I'm making a lot of bad diagnoses and have to have a frank conversation. But if you tell somebody they have cancer or maybe we should think about a hospice program or things like that, that's a salt and battery in, in China and a lot of Asian cultures. So how do I be authentic in terms of, of navigating how I'm talking with patients and how I'm envisioning that relationship while being mindful of the culture of, of, of all of a sudden saying things that culturally isn't done. You can tell the family members whatever you want, but to look somebody in the eye and say, I wish we had something to offer you, but we don't, is just not culturally acceptable. So that, that it kind of in a package, it's probably some of the things I've wrestled with most um, culturally is I'm trying to figure out how to, how to be present and, and make my work there. So, so the accepted way to do it in China is to tell the family and have the family tell the patient then, is that correct? Well, it's to tell the family, but, um, but it's up to the family whether they, um, whether they will tell the, the person or not, whether they think they're strong enough to handle the news. You know, and again, this used to be very common in the United States here. Um, um, but it's introduced a very troubling aspect of the Chinese system right now. One of the big reasons um, people don't go into the healthcare profession in China right now is because of violence on healthcare workers. Patients attacking, family members attacking their family uh, people. I've got pictures of, of healthcare workers wearing helmets in Shenzhen. Why is that? Because, you know, they're sitting around, they think grandma's coming along fine, they have to sell things to keep grandma's care up, and then she up and dies from a disease that everyone knew she was going to die from, but not the patient or necessarily the family. So okay. then they think there's all kinds of malfeasance. So attacks on healthcare workers in China is a major problem. Um, and it's because of this lack of communication, because of a cultural distance and how do you talk about 
death and limits of care and what can be done. So big cultural issue. Have you seen that changing in time at all? I do. Um, it's like a lot of change. You can see things on an edge somewhere that's starting to happen. You know, I visited a hospice in Chanteau. You know, and the whole concept of a hospice is you've let go of the fact that you're going to be doing active treatment and you're going to try and make somebody comfortable realizing death is coming. So the fact that there is a hospice in Chanteau, so there's some thinking that's coming along there. But again, a lot of these issues are deep seated in society. And it would be absolutely, you know, before I would say, no, I, you know, I know Paul, I'm going to have a heart to heart with Paul. Now I'm convinced that if I were to have a heart to heart with Paul and really tell him what's going on without the permission of the family or the family, and most of the time the family say, yeah, I don't think Paul can handle that right now. He's so sick, he's so weak, you're going to push him over the edge. Um, so I think there's there's some change of foot there, but it's it's pretty deep culturally. Oh, thank you, Jody. Yeah, so this isn't necessarily a struggle, but maybe more of an observation in that I think when Westerners in particular um, go into a new culture, we often we bring with us the way that we interact with with our colleagues here, which is to be assertive to make a lot of suggestions, to put our ideas on the table, to kind of take control of the room that, you know, we were, that's looked up to in our country, right? That means that you are, you're at, you know, at the top of the game. And I think what I see, what I find is missing a lot when I'm in, in meetings with, you know, other, other people that are not from that particular culture is sort of the art of listening gets lost. And I think that that's extremely important when you're working in any culture that is not your own. And so I think that it really helps you if you can just uh, step back and try to listen so that you understand. I mean, as a midwife, we say sometimes just you just have to sit on your hands and not do anything. So it's that sort of a thing. Just sit and listen so you can understand what's going on and what, what priorities are for the people from the host country. What is it that they want to accomplish not what you know not what you're there particularly to do and to take time to do that and to be thoughtful about that that's a, yeah that's a very good point let me ask you about one so i um had a group of nurses that came over from uganda at one point and they were struck by the interaction between the nursing staff and the doctors here in in, in that the nursing staff the, the nurses seem to be the primary ones in their view taking care of the patient and the doctor was deferring to them because they knew the patient better. Um, I didn't. Uh, that it was an interesting observation to me. I didn't know how prevalent that was. Is that something you you've heard in other places? Um, I haven't. But you know that doesn't that doesn't mean that it's not true. I mean, I yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what they saw that they thought was different. I have found that physician and nurse relationships to be very collegial in other places that I've been, but, okay, you know, that's limited, right? Yeah. Um, so the next question is, how are indigenous beliefs and uh, medical practices incorporated into healthcare delivery? And how has this come up in any of the countries you have worked in? Um, Abram? Yeah, well, I'm going to first start off by thinking of this because, you know, oftentimes when we think of like indigenous beliefs and medicinal practices, we're, we're thinking of like, what are some crazy things which are happening on people who are not us? But, you know, I'm a white American and I can acknowledge that a lot of white Americans hold a lot of crazy beliefs. You know, just turn on Dr. Oz and look up like what Gwyneth Paltrow is saying about, you know, detoxes and certain chemicals. And, you know, there's, there's these whole sets of beliefs, which I think are incorporated somehow in our medical care or what, at least at the very least that um, doctors and nurses have to deal with a lot. But thinking abroad, um, you know, an example that I will give more recently is uh, an example of religion and vaccination in Indonesia. Uh, so here in the United States, in many states, including Michigan, you can get a religious waiver for vaccination, um, meaning that if you think you have deeply held religious beliefs, you can decide to 
opt your kid out of vaccines, um, vaccine mandates in the local school system. But that kind of seems kind of nebulous. And, you know, what, what religious organization is actually, you know, actually objects to vaccination. And I, you know, I don't think there's like a great example here in the United States for that outside of some limited circumstances. But with my, um, colleagues in Indonesia, what we've noticed in more recent years is there's been some um, Muslim religious councils which have issued fatwas which have um, been related to the use of uh, pig products in vaccine manufacturing. Um, and this specifically is, you know, has come up with measles vaccines. So, um, I mean, I, I think they've tried to be very diplomatic about it because this religious council isn't trying to be like anti-vaccine, but they're also trying to respond to a reality in which, you know, what does it mean to be injected with a vaccine, which at some point might have been like processed through some pig product? Is that, is that like consuming uh, some sort of harm material? So, you know, people can have really deeply held beliefs about that. So uh, it's something that we've kind of struggled with responding to. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the example that comes to mind most for me. Jody? Yeah, so there's there are a lot of um, indigenous beliefs around childbirth in places. Um, and it really impacts the way that women seek care or even if they decide to seek care. So for example, um, if women are delivering in a remote area with a traditional birth attendant, um, that would influence the kind of care that they get versus delivering in a hospital with a skilled birth attendant. There's often um, a lot of use of herbal remedies. Um, some are dangerous, some are, are often used to facilitate labor or to speed labor up. If the woman is having a stall in her labor when she's at home. So there are lots of different things that um, that happen within communities and within sort of that cultural framework or uh, indigenous beliefs around, around childbirth. There's also a lot of superstition around childbirth in, in different places in the world. And so, and it, re it really does impact when, it impacts the care seeking pathway for women, I think. Joe. Yeah, I think it's always important to, I, I liked how uh, Abram started off. I mean, we all have our beliefs in um, something that may or may not work, but we're pretty sure that belief can make us feel better. Uh, and if I have a cold and I turn to chicken soup, I, I have a certain belief and in investment in that chicken soup. Um, in how I'm going to do, regardless of the science. And I think we've often done ourselves a very big disservice when we're not respectful of other people's um, practices and their belief systems. Um, uh, again, just drawing on some analogies in China, um, uh, most people have some practices um, from, with traditional Chinese medicine that go back um, centuries. And this is something that's been in their family. And I know this is what my grandmother would have me do and that's what I'm gonna do. Um, there's hospitals of traditional Chinese medicine that do um, surprisingly good work in my mind. It really opened my eyes. And it's interesting, they'll have a department of Western medicine. Whereas all the Western medicine hospitals will have a department of traditional Chinese medicine. And even if you saw people with some of the worst diseases, uh, a leukemia that requires, can be, you know, uh, really impacted by some highfalutin Western drugs, they'll still have Western drugs involved. And that's where patients will have some sense of peace and security. Um, so, um, I think we've done ourselves a disservice not by respecting that. I think there's a lot of businesses and places that now are starting to look at, at some of the biologic properties of things that have been traditionally used in places like China. Um, one of our partner institutions is Imbarara in Uganda. 
And they have a big World Bank Center of Excellence grant to try and say these things that people are using. Yeah, maybe a lot of them are, are belief in chicken soup feeling, but there's probably some pretty active properties there. Um, how can we sort those out? Can we find the, the next anti-malarial out there? Like one of the ones that's most commonly used that was found in the environment. So, um, so I think there's a healthy respect. There is a tyranny of Western medicine that, you know, we come in and we think we've got the best stuff that can blind us to the other possibilities out there. Vicki. So it's important to understand that pharmacy really got its, its start in the practice of pharmacognosy, which is looking at natural products and, and, and developing medicine. So um, one, of the, one of the first projects I did when um, I went to Kenya was I looked at what people wanted to use for certain conditions. And I fully went in with the hypothesis that they were going to be using natural products that they could get out of their gardens or out of their backyards or on the way of walking into markets versus going into a pharmacy and buying a product. And boy, was I wrong. They really felt that they received better, um, quicker um, treatment if they went into a pharmacy and uh, obtained a product versus if they used um, what they had in their garden. So I, w I was really, really surprised by that. However, this last trip, um, when we were there, we actually uh, met with some elders who have taken it upon themselves to start cataloging some of the, the natural plants. Um, and the kind of the lore behind um, what they can be used for, or what they're good for, because they are seeing a loss of that culture um, with upcoming generations. And so we sat down with them for several hours and, and went through what they had cataloged. And then we did some, some PubMed searches and some Googling um, of this and, and tried to tell them like this, yes, there's actually is some evidence behind um, using this for that indication to kind of help them along because they're hoping to um, publish that so that uh, future generations will have that information because they don't want it um, to be uh, lost, which I thought was, was a really great, uh, really great effort. Let me follow up with you, Vicki. Um, so vaccines have been some of the low cost treatments that have really had profound effects on, on global health. Um, I talked a little bit about that at the beginning. In addition, some of the pharmacists have taken on important leadership roles in a lot of these places. Do you have thoughts on um, what the future is for, for that based on your experiences? Um, and also recommendations for those that are going into uh, being a pharmacist or going to work for a major, pharmace major pharmaceutical company? So one of the biggest surprise uh, of my last trip um, was actually that uh, pharmacists where, where we were uh, working um, are now giving vaccines. And so um, I, you know, they actually, when we, when we met with them and asked them, you know, for our next trip, what can we do to help you? They said, we would love more continuing education on kind of vaccine administration and different vaccines because they're seeing the importance of vaccines and how it uh, can impact the, the patients that they serve. Um, to the point where uh, the, the community center we, where we were staying, the group of elders that we are working with on the natural products book, um, were asking us, where can I go get a shingles vaccine? Where can I go get a flu vaccine? Should I really go get a flu vaccine? Is it really that important? I really don't want to go to the clinic to do that. And so we are very happy to be able to report back to them, well, you can go to, you know, your local chemist um, and get this. Um, done and we were able to get the cost and, and that sort of thing. So we were really happy to see that advancement um, in pharmacy practice. I think for uh, people that are going into the big pharma companies, I think um, counterfeit medications is still a huge issue, especially within um, Kenya. Um, we tried to do a pro product or a project um, looking at counterfeit medications and quickly got shut down. 
um, because uh, they know it's a problem and, and different places didn't want to um, allow us to, to test their medications for fear that they would have purchased um, counterfeit medications, but we know that that's a big um, issue. So, you know, having a uh, big pharma um, work to um, counteract um, counterfeit medications and um, helping the pharmacies obtain them. When we, um, we went, uh, one of the places that we uh, work with has uh, the, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, the PFAR um, HIV clinic. And we started talking with, uh, there's several different pharmacists that they have in those clinics, which is a, a, a really great program. Um, but we started talking about drug shortages. That was the other thing. And there were many of the, the AIDS-related uh, medications that they, they were on critical shortage of. And so they were having to ration them, which is not great for HIV patients, or they're having to switch them to alternative therapies, which again is not really optimal um, for people that have HIV or AIDS. And so um, this is also an area where I think that uh, pharma can definitely have um, an impact in helping to uh, reduce uh, drug shortages wherever possible. And I think that was all I was thinking about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is for, for everyone. And Joe, I'll start with you. Um, what are your initial thoughts on how COVID is going to affect the provision of healthcare? Um, for example, uh, what are we being forced to learn about telemedicine that's going to affect the way care is offered in low and middle income countries in the future? And anything beyond telemedicine too? Boy, I think it's going to be huge. Um, when I think about big inflection points in um, in my life, my career, um, you know, when we, uh, NASA decided to go to the moon, the Apollo moon program, and all of the spinoff from that technology, I think we're going to have that kind of impact from COVID-19 um, that's going to change so much, uh, at least the way um, uh, uh, medicine is practiced and science is pursued, at least over the rest of my career. Um, one of the big areas, and, and um, I, I suspect Vicki is much, more, I know Vicki is much more knowledgeable than I am on this, but just the whole concept of vaccines. How can the world be shut down? How can we all be sitting around waiting for a year and a half for vaccines? Um, so some of the technologies that are evolving out there both with um, turnaround times on making vaccines, how we're gonna kind of jump over some of our previous paradigms of giving a foreign agent and waiting for us to raise an antibody to it. Well, maybe it's actually us giving some of the messenger RNA that makes that happen. Um, I think we're gonna end up with a dynamic where there's gonna be quicker and more infections that come up and we're gonna be in a quick rapid cycle battle to get a vaccine against it. Um, uh, some of the futurists envision the day where, you know, you hear something's out there in the community and, you know, you wear a Band-Aid with the little pricks on it and the vaccine that's against that for, uh, for the next week. Um, and I think the spinoff from those technologies is how we manipulate the immune system that both protects us from um, infection, but also starts to counteract what happens when one of our, our cell lines go bad and we're growing a tumor. And how can we better harness the immune system? So I think the, the spin-offs from this, I mean, it's just been profound, the impacts on our, our economy and our way of thinking that I think a lot of the best and the brightest from around the world are gonna to rise to the occasion here. Absolutely, telehealth, um, um, knock me over with a feather how much care I'm providing to patients right now and not seeing them and how much they like it, how much they like sitting in their kitchen when I'm talking with them. Now I'm a proceduralist, so I do a lot of my, my, my procedures are putting an endoscope uh, down somebody's mouth or up their rear end. You know, obviously that's not replaced by telehealth, but you can do so much more 
um, and you're starting to prevent the, 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 the consequences of people coming to the hospital, the inconvenience, the cost. Um, finally, globally, I, um, when I think about the global health conversations and the practices I'm having where I'm not, um, you know, where I'm not um, add, adding my carbon footprint to all the flights and all the movement around, it's really calling the critical question when do you need to really be present physically with somebody? When do you need to lay on hands versus um, when another um, pathway may help it? So I think we're embarking on a revolution that people maybe are gonna be going back and saying, thank God we had COVID-19, otherwise we wouldn't have had all these um, uh, uh, pleasant after effects from it. That's a very optimistic view. Jody, I'll let you follow that one up. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think it's fascinating. Um, and just, and I'll give you an example of what I've seen in the last few months since COVID's happened. And we were, and we had two different projects going on in West Africa. And one of the things that has really like caught my eye is how, well, West Africa, for one thing, was sort of ahead of the ball with COVID because they had dealt with Ebola. So they had a lot of good things already in place that really had nothing to do with telemedicine. But one of the things that they're using, and specifically I've seen this in Ghana, is using WhatsApp to get information out to healthcare providers in the very rural areas. So as part of our one of our projects that we have going on, we have a WhatsApp chat with a number of different uh, nurses and midwives that are located very remotely. And so we get the same information they're getting. And what, what I started to get was um, the guidelines on Ghana's COVID-19 guidelines for mitigation. That came across WhatsApp. And they sent out videos on how to make a mask, how to put it on, how to take it off, how to clean it, so that they had this information. And it was just being sent out to all of these providers virtually from the district level or the central ministry level, which was just, that was just fascinating to me. And so I think there's, um, I think they're ahead of us actually on a lot of things that we can learn from them how to do with like, you know, really low tech kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. And the information sharing becomes critical in times like this and you figure out better ways to do it. Right. Uh, as Joe said, sometimes by not, you don't always have to travel there and, and there are these other technologies that are readily used for that. Abram, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, so one thing I will say, um, it's interesting people mentioning like WhatsApp and in China, you know, they use WeChat a lot. Um, I think in the United States here, people have been kind of reticent to embrace certain technologies because of HIPAA. And, you know, even using like blue jeans versus Zoom, you know, we had a flurry of emails at the University of Michigan of like, which one can people use? And, um, and I, I think for better or worse, there's often less sort of ethical safeguards in those um, circumstances uh, in, in low and middle income countries. Um, but I'll also want to riff off of what uh, Joe said, and in particular thinking about vaccines, because I you know, do most of my research with vaccines. Uh, you know, in the past, most of our vaccines have been what we'd call like a, a killed vaccine or an attenuated vaccine. And more recently, there's been a few vector vaccines on the market. But with the COVID-19 vaccine development, there's like, four or five different categories of vaccines, which we haven't even used before. Uh, so I think all this technology, I could see it rapidly being applied to uh, other infections and hopefully, you know, out of all this COVID-19 mess, we can also develop like better influenza vaccines. And I, I hope that there's a lasting attention to some more of the more public health aspects. I know after 9-11 and especially after sort of the anthrax mailings, there was like this huge dump of money from the federal government into public health, but that sort of tapered off after a bit. And I'm, I'm curious to see how public health will be funded in the future in the United States and in other countries, given that we have this history of COVID-19. Well, can I just follow up on these? Because this is, this is starting me, it, it, this discussion is great. And it, it made me think about the last question that you asked me about working in big pharma. And I think it also has to do with um, identifying and thinking about novel ways of, of delivering not only vaccines, but other medications as well. And so, you know, um, one of the, the challenges that we've identified in some of the research that we've done 
uh, has around insulin, people being given insulin and not having refrigerators to put it in or not being told about the, you know, how to appropriately handle it, but then also um, oral contraception um, and thinking about novel ways um, of delivering medications, taking medications four or five times a day just doesn't work. Um, when you have a crop to deal with and you have food to cook and you have children to take care of and, and that sort of thing. And so I think that's uh, some place where, where pharma, uh, whether it's depot medications or long acting medications can really, uh, really impact um, human health. Great. Thank you. Um, so when we look at, so, so within the University of Michigan, we've got a number of global reach, um, one uh, initiatives, one that's called global reach, Joe. Uh, when we see those organized, um, do you have thoughts at, for a research institute on how that's better organized, whether that's geographically or on specific um, types of diseases uh, or how, and, and I guess, organizationally, but also as an individual. Joe, do you want to start with that one? Um, I think in general, we're better off if we can bring systems thinking approaches to the problems and the opportunities. And a lot of times we haven't. Um, we've tried to isolate a problem and say, we're going to come up with one fix. Um, in the medical research literature, for example, a lot of times people are looking um, and they're doing studies on drugs, say, let's say diabetes. And they're trying to imagine a patient that just has diabetes and they're doing a very pure study. Um, when in reality, most of the patients we see have diabetes and they have blood pressure problems and they have heart failure and they have a number of things with a number of different medications. So a lot of our approaches can sometimes not be real life. Um, and um, so for example, uh, a lot of work on the, on the Ebola vaccine or a cure for, for something in Africa. And you have to think about the systems approaches there. Um, the whole delivery chain, the cold chain that, that Vicki was talking about, um, storage, all the cost factors, things like that. Sometimes we've, we've tried to isolate a problem and just deal with that problem outside of the context. I appreciate the, the movements and the approaches right now that are bringing systems thinking to the problem and to say, you know, this, this is not just one problem here. There's a whole bunch of contributors and solutions. We have to take a systems approach. So for, for people looking at healthcare in low resource settings, they have to look at the system. They can't just look at a doctor, a nurse, um, the hospital, it's the system. And one of the things that I'm reminded of now, especially a lot of my emphasis is on training. Um, th there, was a mo there was a time when people were dying and they have their biggest morbidity from the lack of, 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 of access to care. We've kind of crossed a tipping point, at least in Africa. Most people are dying from bad care or wrong care rather than no care. And it takes a system to fix that. And if we just try and dabble with one part of the system without seeing all the interconnecting points, and that's, that's a place where a research institution or units can come together collectively and collaboratively. I like the interdisciplinary approach you've taken to designing this course, Paul, because it takes a number of different viewpoints to see all the contributors that need to be factored in when you're trying to advance a common good. Jody, you want to add, do you have anything to add to that? No, just I just to maybe expand a little bit and, and continue on that thought and to include when you're doing, if you're doing um, capacity building, especially like in for healthcare, to think about team training and to think about using this interprofessional um, education mode where you're bringing everybody to the table who's, you know, if it's gastroenterology or it's childbirth, everybody who's like involved in the care of that patient is working together and you're training together so that you see what each 
each individual discipline brings to the table and how they fit into the puzzle pieces. It's a great plug for the course, Jody. Um, Abram or Vicky, do you, Abram, do you have anything to add? No, I don't. I, I mean, I would just echo what everyone else is saying. So um, nothing specific to add, but I know we're also coming up on our time and I don't want to go over yep. for everyone who has a busy evening ahead. So Vicki, let me start with you. I just have one last question. Just a couple words on what global health over the next five or 10 years. Um, do you see it uh, similar progress to what we've seen over the past 20, 30 years or tapering off? Where, where do you see it going? Just a quick quick response to that. I, I hope it expands. I hope that, that we see major advances. And I think that um, this pandemic has showed us that we are a global community. And what happens in one part of the world affects other parts of the world and that we all need to work together. Um, and again, you know, I think it's already been discussed. I, I totally agree that it's it's not lack of care that's killing a lot of people. It's it's bad care, and we're seeing a skyrocketing increase in diabetes and hypertension um, in you know low and middle income countries, which we can't even. Well, we know how to treat; we just don't treat them appropriately. And right. so, and, um, and in some sense, that's good news because that means people reach that stage where they can be dying of that. They're not dying at the under five. Not eight. malaria anymore. Right. It's right. not these other things. So, right. Abram, quick, quick response in the next five years. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very curious to see what will happen with COVID-19, but I, I think there's a lot of interest from students in global health. And what I would like to see more of is not only just like um, IP perspective, where we get more people in different departments thinking about similar issues, but uh, like a truly global setting where we can reach out to people in other settings and kind of reflect on, you know, what do they think about the United States healthcare system and us to them as well. So it's a bit more reciprocal. Great. Jody. I see huge advance, uh, advances happening in the next five to 10 years. And I think it, it's just the, the, especially the students that are coming up. I think people have huge curiosity in this and huge interest in this and really have a lot that they can offer and, and help make, you know, the world a better place. Great. Joe? Boy, I, I agree with it, particularly Jody, but I think it's a tremendous time of innovation. I wish I were younger, um, but when it, the uh, innovation gets unleashed in Africa in some of these low income places where people are taking fresh looks at the kind of problems that they're gonna be fixing that will inform our own system. You know, the last thing we wanna do is bring our system to these low income countries. So I think there's going to be an explosion of innovation and creativity that we're going to benefit from. And uh, I think it's a great time to be in global health. I'm just not sure it'll stay called global health. You know, people in Africa don't call it global health. Uh, you know, they talk, they, they call it health. Yeah. So I think we're going to maybe have some reconfigured thinking, but this is a great time to be uh, going into this space. What a positive note to end on. So um, thanks very much to all of you and, and really looking forward to the course and hearing from each of you in a lot more um, depth. And thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so that's it. And thanks to all of our audience for joining as well. And um, some of you will be seeing in uh, about a month. Thank thanks. you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.